my name is Dr. Rajiv Mohotra, and I'm a cardiologist uh, from Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, where I serve as the Associate Director of the Cardiopulmonary Exercise Laboratory. Uh, today, we'll be discussing our study uh, related to uh, percent predicted peak oxygen pulse as a predictor of vascular response patterns to exercise in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. The background of the study is really to identify non-invasive exercise measures in heart failure that can give insight into the hemodynamic responses of the of patients with heart failure. So we focused on um, over 150 patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So their LV ejection fraction was more than 50%, but uh, they had a hemodynamic evidence of FF, meaning their resting wedge pressure was either greater than 15 millimeters of mercury, or during exercise, their wedge increased relative to their cardiac output by more than two millimeters of mercury per liter per minute. So this is a standard hemodynamic definition of HEFPEF. And what we found, what we were trying to do in this study is, is as, as we know, you know, as cardiologists know, is we're trying to gain insight into, you know, the severity of the disease of patients with heart failure. And also, if there are any non-invasive measures during a cardiopulmonary exercise test, that can give insights into what's going on hemodynamically in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Um, we're very fortunate at our institution to be able to perform cardiopulmonary exercise testing in the context of invasive hemodynamic assessment. So we, well, what our protocol has been is to have patients go to the cath lab, get uh, a Swan-Gans catheter placed, a, a right heart catheterization performed in the cath lab at rest under supine conditions, and then bring them over to our exercise lab, exercise physiology lab, where we have them um, in an upright position performing bicycle exercise on a cycle ergometer. And every, uh, you know, while they're exercising and during recovery from exercise, we're actually measuring their intracardiac pressures, their PA pressures. Every minute we're getting their wedge pressure, and then we're also sampling blood for a mixed venous oxygen saturation. These patients also have an arterial catheter in so that we can get arterial uh, saturations as well. This way we have every component of the, of the thick cardiac output and can therefore uh, very easily measure peak VO2, uh, heart rate, um, oxygen extraction peripherally, and then back calculate the stroke volume. In this way, we're able during exercise to get the full hemodynamic response to exercise and then correlate that with your more typical non-invasive cardiopulmonary exercise tests. Um, and that's exactly what we did in this, in this study. So basically we looked at uh, over 150 patients with HEPFEF and we're trying to determine whether uh, the non-invasive measure of oxygen pulse or peak oxygen pulse, which would be a typical measure in a non-invasive CPET, whether that value or variable correlated with any important hemodynamic measures that we obtained um, during the study. What we found was very interesting. So, um, you know, when we think about it, so peak oxygen consumption or peak VO2 is a very important predictor of long-term outcomes and of disease severity in patients with uh, HEFPEF. And that is usually broken down into two components, heart rate and peak oxygen pulse. Um, and so what we focused on was the peak oxygen pulse component of oxygen consumption. And what we found was is that there's a strong association of peak oxygen pulse with hemodynamic responses to exercise. Um, at the very basics, you know, those who those patients who were in the highest tertile of peak oxygen pulse, of course, had higher augmentation in their cardiac output and higher overall peak VO2s. But when we dive, dove deeper into the hemodynamic responses to exercise, what we found is, is that the uh, peak oxygen pulse correlated strongly with what the systemic vascular resistance was doing. And so, uh, you know, the systemic vascular resistance typically during exercise should go down, you know, as, as we exercise, 
we need to augment our cardiac output. We need to augment our, our blood flow. And the, in order to accommodate that increased blood flow without having extraordinarily high systemic blood pressures, the systemic vascular resistance, the, the systemic vasculature needs to vasodilate and the systemic vascular resistance needs to go down. And so, um, and so those, pa those patients who had the best exercise from a peak oxygen pulse perspective had the best response in terms of a, a, a reduction or decrement in, in systemic vascular resistance. What this highlights potentially is that, you know, as other people have already hypothesized, is that there's a strong vascular component to HFEF. Now, we know that HFEF, as of date, you know, has no approved therapies. It's very different physiologically from HFEF. And, and this is in large part due to the fact that maybe we don't understand the disease as well as we would like to, and that it, it's because the patients that are diagnosed with HFEF actually represent a very heterogeneous population. And what we're finding is that within HFEF, there are subsets of patients who have an inappropriate vascular response to exercise, meaning that they're not getting the appropriate reduction in systemic vascular resistance. They're not getting the appropriate vasodilatory response to exercise that other HFEF patients or normal, normal individuals would have. And so the inability to uh, appropriately vasodilate the systemic vasculature then results in two things, um, two things that affect the peak oxygen pulse. One is you're not able to augment your stroke volume. And two, you're not able to perhaps get enough peripheral oxygen extraction in the tissues without an appropriate vasodilatory response. So, so we think that it makes you know, mechanistic and physiologic sense why, uh, why the peak oxygen pulse so closely uh, was tied in or linked to the systemic vascular resistance response to exercise. Now this then had other effects. So when, you know, because of the inappropriate uh, vasodilatory response of the systemic vasculature, stroke volume didn't augment as much in those patients, uh, you know, with HFEF, and this resulted in backward increase in cardiac intracardiac filling pressures or congestion, as we would call it, in the sense that the, the, the pulmonary artery pressures were higher in those that had a worse peak oxygen pulse. Uh, relative to the cardiac output. And so uh, what we can really conclude finally from this, uh, what we can say from this study uh, uh, is that we really think that there's an important key feature of the vasculature in, in driving the exercise response patterns in heart failure. What this suggests is that when we're thinking about the mechanisms of HFEF, you know, we need to think about the vasculature. Uh, and, uh, you know, we really need to start thinking about targeting vascular disease, such as arterial stiffness, when we're, when we're thinking about potentially treating HFEF. And so, you know, already the guidelines, you know, the, the class one indications for management in HFEF only include, you know, include, you know, the first thing is, you know, treatment of hypertension, or high blood pressure. And that gets at some of these vascular responses to exercise. You don't want a hypertensive response to exercise. You really want that, you know, systemic vascular resistance to be able to vasodilate, you know, during exercise. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think that it highlights a key role for blood vessels, the, the arterial responses uh, to exercise uh, in HFF. And I think what that means is that we need to be looking for drugs uh, or, or, or molecular targets that impact the ability of the systemic vasculature to vasodilate in response to exercise or, you know, or in general. Uh, this could be things like the nitric oxide pathway, although unfortunately, uh, you know, prior, you know, prior trials, including the RELAX study, showed no benefit of PD-5 inhibition in HFEF. But maybe we need to take a closer look at, at, at the role of PD-5 inhibitors in HFEF. And, and the reason why I'll say that is that not everyone that's diagnosed with HFEF has an abnormal systemic vascular response. It's a subset. And so maybe it's that subset of patients that will benefit the most from, from maybe nitric oxide uh, generating therapy like such as PD-5 inhibitors. So that's where I see the field really heading is really you know, finding the subset of patients with the inappropriate vascular response and then targeting, targeting those with, with potential uh, vascular beneficial therapies.